Okay, today is the unit seven review on natural selection. We have no time to waste, let's get started. Evolution, by definition, is change over time. This word is used a lot, you know, I'm wearing a Bucks jersey today. They're saying how the Bucks team evolved over the season, how they changed over time. So it's just life changes over time. Uh, these are things that Darwin and many other scientists observed. Darwin was one of the more famous scientists to realize this. But life changes over time. Uh, life has been around for about 3.6 billion years, and it's been changing ever since. So here we go. Microevolution. I'm going to go over a lot of terms first, okay? A lot of terms. I got most of these terms from the flashcards, which are recommended that you get. Uh, first, we have microevolution. These are changes within a gene pool, but they don't lead to a, um, it doesn't lead to speciation. So in this classroom, we have four humans. I see lighter hair, I see darker hair, I see lighter eyes, I see darker eyes, I see different shapes of faces, different heights, different colors, different body types. These are all just variations, but we're all homo sapiens. That's going to be microevolution. Then macroevolution are going to be dramatic changes in the gene pool that do lead to speciation. So um, I'm going to try to think of as many examples as I can that we did in class where the green iguana from Central America, um, it, some swam to the Caribbean and they, they changed into a new species because they underwent so much uh, genetic drift. Um, and then you had the ones that swam to the Galapagos in the Pacific Ocean, they became the marine iguanas. They experienced so much change that they could no longer be considered the um, green iguanas from Central America. All right, evidence for evolution. We watched that video on whales and cetaceans and all the various uh, evidences there are for evolution. We have a fossil record, which is going to be remains of prehistoric organisms. You know, the, we, we look, no one has actually seen a dinosaur other than birds. We may look at alligators and crocodiles and think, oh, that's a dinosaur. Far from it. It's actually birds. We know that birds are more closely related to dinosaurs than reptiles are because of the fossil remains that they've left behind. Modern day birds are the descendants of prehistoric dinosaurs, prehistoric um, reptile-like animals. And dinosaurs are actually kind of like a transition from reptiles to birds. Speaking of transition, transition fossils um, can serve as links between species. Remember we watched the video on the prehistoric whales and how they shifted from being a land dwelling mammal into a marine dwelling mammal? All, we have many different types of transition fossils. You have A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, E to F, F to G, and so on and so on. You don't just have T-Rex bird. It doesn't go that easy. It's not skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex, skeleton of a pigeon. You have a lot of transition species that blend it. So it's not going from black to white. It's black to really dark gray, then a little bit lighter gray, then a little bit lighter gray. And it's many shades of gray from one species to another, which can help, help to link them. Uh, we have comparative anatomy, where organisms share anatomical features and structures. When you take human anatomy, human anatomy, there's a reason that you dissect a cat because they have comparative anatomy with us. They're, we're both mammals, we have the same muscles, we have the same bones, the same organs. It's really almost identical. Uh, but comparative anatomy is comparing one species to another species and seeing how they have similar bones and organs and body structures. Homologous structures, key in on the prefix homo, that means the same. These are shared um, origins 
but modified. Think of a human arm, a whale flipper, a cat leg, and a bat wing. All these body parts, a whale flipper, a human arm, a cat leg, a bat wing, they have all the same bones, humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, which are wrist bones, metacarpals, which are hand bones, and phalanges, which are finger bones. They all have a common origin. Now, analogous structures, and means other or opposite, these are going to be um, common function, but different origins. A bat has a wing. It has bones. It has blood vessels and nerves and tissues. A bird has a wing. It has bones. It has muscles. It has ligaments. It has tissue. A butterfly has a wing. It is not the same. A bat wing and a butterfly wing are both meant for flying. That's the common function, but they do not have a common origin. An example I would also say in class is Isabella has uh, legs. So does a grasshopper. But Isabella's legs have bone and cartilage and ligaments and tendons and blood vessels and so on and so on and so on. An ant leg doesn't have all that, but they have a common purpose, which is to walk and to move around. Then we have the stigial structures, which are structures that no longer serve a function, but once did. Like the, the, the hip bones of a whale, or the appendix of a human, or the third eyelid of a human, or let's see, um, if you look at some large snakes like anacondas and pythons, they have little leg bones that are still left from when they actually had legs. So vestigial structures are structures that no longer serve a function, but they once did. If you took them away from the organism, you would be totally fine. Like when you lose your appendix, you, you're not, your life isn't shortened, you'll, you'll be fine. That's a vestigial structure. Comparative embryology is similar stages of gestation. If I showed you a three-week-old embryo of a human and a three-week-old three week, um, embryo of a dolphin, I would pay you to tell me the difference. Show me where the differences are. There's none. They look very, very similar because a dolphin and a human have a recent common ancestry. They're both mammals. And heck, if you look at an embryonic chicken, or turtle, or any other vertebrate for that matter, we look very similar. And then probably the most important one of all is DNA. All life has a common um, molecular, and when I say molecular, I'm referring to DNA structure. Whether you are a blue whale, a redwood tree, a mushroom, an E. coli bacteria, or a Rachel Bell here in first period. We all have adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. Everything in nature has that. Every kingdom, every domain, every creature there has ever been. A, T, C, G. The, remember that the fewer differences that are present between two species, the more closely related they are. Then we have biogeography, which talks about how um, the earth has changed and species have moved about the earth over time. For instance, where do we find the majority of Earth's marsupials? We find them in Australia. Um, that's an example of biogeography, how they were isolated and Australia used to be part of Pangaea, the one giant supercontinent, but then it, through continental drift, it broke off and became an island, and all those organisms were stuck on that island, and they evolved very differently. That's an example of biogeography. All right, moving on. Again, we have a lot to get to. This is a review, not an intro. Uh, Lamarck's theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics. Lamarck was mostly wrong. He came before Darwin, but he got the conversation started. 
You don't have to be right to make a difference. So Lamarck's theory of, acquired in, of inheritance of acquired characteristics basically said that whatever traits a parent develops during its life will be passed on to offspring. Rachel, if you decide to go into um, physical fitness, you want to be a bodybuilder. You're like, you can bench 500 pounds. You have all this muscle mass. Are your children going to be born big and bulky? No. Isabella, let's say that you decide to go in the military, you experience an accident, and you lose a foot. Are your children going to be born without a foot? No. If I got skin cancer from being out at the beach too long, um, you know, I get a really, 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 really dark tan, but I also get a little bit of skin cancer. My children aren't going to be born really tan with little pieces of skin cancer all over their body. That's not how it works. But that's what Lamarck's theory would suggest. Then we have Darwin's theory of natural selection, where environmental pressures select in favor of individuals with a greater biological fitness. Nature selects in favor of traits and nature selects against traits. As I said a few days ago, we all know that polar bears evolved from grizzly bears. Um, there were some grizzly bears that experienced a mutation where they were born with white fur. If that mutation happened in the jungle, that would be a horrible mutation, be a white bear in a jungle. But if it happened in the North Pole, it would be really, really good. So it really, the mutations are obviously the driver of evolution. But the environment is what really determines, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? All right, types of natural selection. This one, people forget a lot. And I remember going over it to be sure when we did the mock exam a few weeks ago, I saw a lot of pens moving when I did this because some of the answers were way off base. Stabilizing selection is the intermediate phenotype is favored over extremes. I'll make a graph at the end of all of this. There, there are three graphs that you will need to be able to identify. So a stabilizing selection looks like a bell curve. The intermediate phenotype is most advantageous, being an extreme phenotype. So let's say we had a white moth, a gray moth, and a black moth. Gray is the middle of white and black. Gray would be advantageous here. Directional is where one extreme phenotype is favored over the intermediate and other extreme phenotype. And then we have disruptive selection where the extreme phenotypes, plural, are favored over the intermediate. Okay, so here's what we'll do. Um, some of you may only have one color at your disposal, so we can always improvise. Life is all about improvisation, so I'll do that with you. I have all these colors here. I know that not everybody does, so let, let's make this little graph here, okay? We're going to have E for extreme, E for extreme, and I for intermediate, okay? Here's what we'll do. A solid line will represent stabilizing selection. Here it is. In a, in a, a question that you got on your mock exam had this, this was, don't write this down, just look, this was before, and then it looked like this after, just watch. 
And the correct answer was, what happened? Or excuse me, the question was, what happened? And the answer was, the, uh, this is stabilizing selection in the intermediate phenotype was selected to be more, in, more favorable. So it became even more um, stabilizing. I, th I forget which mock exam that was, but that was one of them. Okay, let's uh, fix all that. Okay, so once again, stabilizing selection, the intermediate is favored. All right, dotted line is going to be direction. Here's direction. Now, listen carefully, everybody. That could have gone either way. I could have favored the extreme phenotype on the right, or it could favor the one on the left. And we'll also make something very, very clear to you. Lucas, look at the solid line. Are there still individuals with the extreme phenotype? Yes. Remember to know the difference between few and none. My classroom only has three students right now. To me, for me to say my classroom has no students right now, that would be incorrect. Be sure you know the difference between none and a few. Don't just think because numbers are low, oh, there are none. It's not necessarily accurate. All right. And then this type of dotted line is going to be disruptive. Ready? Here we go. This is where the intermediate phenotype is not favored and the extreme phenotypes are. For instance, there was a problem on the mock exam where it said being a, a small bird, not very good. Being a big bird, not very good. Being a medium-sized bird, um, that's good. That would be stabilizing. But when it flipped it, it said being medium is bad, but being big or being small, that's good. That would be disruptive. Okay. Let's get to artificial selection now. Just a lot of terms, guys. I mean, I have a lot here for you. Artificial selection is selection of traits influenced and guided by humans. When I would ask what are some types of natural selection, I remember one student said artificial selection. I'm like, no. Natural selection is not artificial selection. Artificial selection is how we have dogs and cats and livestock, um, a lot of crops like wheat and corn and different types of flour and fruit. Those are all artificially selected. A lemon and a lime are man-made. Uh, wheat is man-made. Corn, as we know it today, is man-made. Dogs and cats, man-made. All right, let's get to Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium infers that there is no evolution happening. That's what the equilibrium part is all about. Um, now, these are the five conditions that Hardy-Weinberg has, but I want to keep in mind, guys, that if it, you were to have Hardy-Weinberg, there will be no, 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 and you would cross out the non part for just random mania. If you had these, you would have Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to define these terms and then know that the opposite of these would result in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Gene flow is the mixing of gene pools. If I have horses in North America and they are going to start breeding with horses from Asia, that's gene flow. If I have bald eagles in Florida and they're going to start breeding with bald eagles in Canada, that is gene flow. Genetic drift are going to be changes in allelic frequencies. Let's say that a population was 90% yellow, 10% black. And then over time it became 70% yellow and 30% black. That's genetic drift. Slight changes in the population. Natural selection, obviously, we know is um, selection of traits deemed to be biologically fit. Mutation are going to be random 
changes to the gene. And random, excuse me, non-random mating is where you actually have sexual selection. And this is a vocab term within a vocab term. Sexual selection is um, selecting mates with the most desired traits. This is not a form of sexual, or excuse me, this is not a form of natural selection. If you're asked different types of natural selection, don't say sexual selection. No, no, no. The types of natural selection are directional, disruptive, stabilizing. Okay? Now, as far as Hardy Weinberg e uh, equation, P plus Q equals 1.0, you will be given that equation on your um, formula sheet. P is the frequency of the what? Anybody? The dominant, not trait. Well, I guess you could say trait. I, I apologize, you are correct. Uh, the dominant allele, dominant trait's fine. And then what is Q, the frequency of what? The frequency of the recessive allele. Now, you are given this part, guys. You are not given what they need. Okay, the other equation is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1.0. What is P squared? Frequency of homozygous dominance. What is Q squared? Frequency of what? Heterozygous. And Q squared is frequency of what? Homozygous recessive. Okay. You are given the equation for genotypic frequency. And that's what this is. This one over here on the left is allelic frequency. And the one over here is genotypic frequency. All right. Now, I want to be sure you guys know how to find one from the other, from, from the other, from the other, from the other, from the other. I have blue eyes. What do you know my genotype is for my eyes? Is it homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive? you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am homozygous recessive. Isabella has bl uh, brown hair. Do I know what her genotype is? No, I don't. I know what it can narrow down to, like heterozygous or homozygous dominant. I don't know which. So my point here is if you can identify the individuals that are um, homozygous recessive, you're made. So if you can figure out what Q squared is, the next variable you want to get is Q. When you do that, is you do the square root of Q squared, that equals Q. After you find Q, check. You know that P plus Q equals 1.0. Flip that around to be 1.0 minus Q equals P. Now you've got P. So you've got Q squared, you've got Q, you've got P. Now to get from P to P squared, just do P squared. Square it. And then you do two times P times Q, and you're done. Now keep this in mind. Um, there are four students in this classroom, or there's four, excuse me, there are four humans in this classroom. One has a recessive trait. So one out of four, it would be um, 0.25. So the frequency for this classroom to be homozygous recessive for eye color is 25% or 0.25. If I wanted to figure out what Q was for that, I would do 0.25 or the square root of 0.25. Then let's actually try that. So Q equals 0.5. 1.0 minus 0.5 equals 0.5. That's P. So look what I've got so far. And then we do 0.5 squared. That's going to be 0.25. That's P squared. And then 2 times P times Q would be 2 times 0.5 times 
That's going to equal 0.5. So 2PQ equals 0.5. You just did Hardy Weinberg. But what if I were to ask you, okay, you have four individuals. How many of them have blue eyes? Well, we have our four, which is our total, times the percentage or the frequency. And I know you can probably do this one in your head. Well, what, what's 25% of four? One. That's how you figure it out. If we had, guys, if we had uh, 387, I don't know, let's make it up a number. We had 387 humans in this room. 25% of them were homozygous recessive for eyes. I want to know how many is that? Just do the total times the frequency. 387 times 0.25. We would say 96.75 are homozygous recessive. They have blue eyes. Some people really st uh, struggle with that. That's why I want to make myself very clear. All right. Hope that helps. Let's continue on. Again, a lot to get to. The bottleneck effect is a reduction of genes in a gene pool. This can be caused by a lot of things. Um, a natural disaster killed a lot of individuals and their genes with it. Uh, a bunch of hunters or poachers killed a lot of individuals and so there's fewer genes in the population. Um, I know this is gonna be a very crass example, but just to try to keep in, in touch with nature, let's say that you three in this classroom are the final survivors of some like disaster, like a fire, everybody else passed away. Is that kid who sits in C, in C3, is his genetics gonna be in future generations? No, he's gone. How about C12? No, they're gone. So you guys experience a bottleneck effect where you had all these individuals, look at all this, all these genes, and then it just got funneled into what's left. This is you guys. This is what was. This is the initial population. These are the survivors. That's known as the bottleneck. The founder effect is where individuals and their genetics establish a new population. So um, let me do an example of this. I was thinking about this on my way to plant today. Let's say, and this is you know, just my crazy brain. Let's say we have a population of bunny rabbits. And there's several traits. There's um, black, there's chinchilla, there's Himalayan. These are all multiple alleles. We did this on the last lesson or unit five lesson, and this is white. So let's say that we have a population of rabbits with all these different alleles, okay? But riddle me this. What if a bunny rabbit with this and this, they decide to go off and like migrate away and they start a brand new population, these two. What alleles will the future populations have? From which traits will be in the future populations of, this, of these founders? Himalayan and white only. Are there going to be black bunnies? Are there going to be chinchilla? No. It's just going to be Himalayan and white. That's all you're going to have in the future populations of these founders. Very good. All right. Keep it going. Speciation is the formation of new species. It's the opposite of extinction. Um, the rhinoceros iguana speciated from the green iguana. It evolved from it. Um, over 65, more than 100 million years, birds, various species of birds evolved from dinosaurs. We would say that they speciated from them. So speciation is the opposite of extinction. Extinction is the eradication of species. Speciation is the, basically, the creation of the species. Allopatric speciation is... Um, the formation of new species due to geographic barriers. We're talking canyons, fences, 
uh, canals, valleys, oceans, rivers, lakes. And when they're separate, they are going to be under different conditions. In Africa, we have, there's a giant bird called an ostrich. In South America, there's a giant bird called a rhea. It looks very similar to, the, to an ostrich. Those two birds are separated from the Atlantic Ocean, but we all know that Africa and South America used to be together, but now they're separated. That's allopatric speciation, the formation of the species due to geographic barrier. Sympatric speciation is no geographic barrier. Formation new species without physical geographic barriers. You're like, well, what's, why are they evolving separately? Well, here's what we have. We have prezygotic and postzygotic isolating mechanisms. They live together. They live in the same environment. They're just not interested in each other. When I was telling you this in class, a lot of, I remember myself asking as a kid, would a, would a cardinal and a blue jay make a purple bird? A blue jay and a cardinal, would they, would they have a baby? Would it be purple? Well, scientifically, they want nothing to do with each other. When a male blue jay sings, only a female blue jay really recognizes it. A, male, a female cardinal, it's just noise. It's just noise. When you guys hear bullfrogs in the summertime after rain and all you hear is those frogs are just screaming. To you, that's just the noise of the night. For a frog, that means I'm looking for love. I'm looking for love now. So that would be uh, behavioral isolation. Here are the prezygotic. This is prezygotic is going to be no zygote is formed. Remember that a zygote is a fertilized egg. These are the five things that will keep them from uh, forming. Habitat isolation, you live in different areas. A panda and a grizzly bear will not form a zygote because they live in different areas. These are all pretty self-explanatory. Temporal isolation is all about time. Um, why will an owl and a hawk never have offspring? Because an owl is active during the night and a hawk is active during the day. Uh, why will a tree frog and a bullfrog never have offspring? Because a tree frog reproduces in April, a bullfrog reproduces in August. So that's different timing. Behavioral isolation, um, different courtship patterns, different dances or songs or... Um, Again, court, different courting behaviors. Let's say that a alligator growls when it's trying to attract a mate. Well, if you are a rattlesnake, you're not looking for growling. Rattlesnakes attract a mate in a totally different fashion. Um, mechanical isolation is where the, the coupling or the actual act of sex doesn't work because the, the organs are not a match. Um, the lining up of the bodies for sexual reproduction is not a match. It's just not going to work out. Mechanical means like the actual parts don't match up. Penises and vaginas, they're just not going to be compatible. And then we have gamete isolation where, oh, you actually had sex, but the sperm and the egg are totally not going to work together. They're just, it's not going to happen. Not going to work. So those are the five prezygotic. Here's the three postzygotic. This is where you actually made a zygote. Congratulations. A zygote is formed. but ultimately there will not be a new species. So the first one is zygote mortality. You made a zygote, great, bravo. The zygote dies. It doesn't even divide. You don't even get to two cells, it, it dies. Hybrid sterility is like a mule or a liger. You had a hybrid, it was born. That's fantastic. A lion and a tiger made a liger. The liger can't reproduce, it's sterile. And then F2 fitness means that you have like species one and species two. Remember, this is the P generation. They breed, they have a hybrid. And then you take another hybrid and they breed. You have the, you know, the um, hybrid offspring. This is F1 generation, this is F2. This guy is sterile. The F2 generation is not going to be able to reproduce. Okay, keep going. Uh, convergence evolution is where unrelated species evolve 
similar traits due to common pressures. Lucas, other than being a vertebrate, is a whale, does a whale have any close relationship to a loggerhead sea turtle? Other than being a vertebrate? The answer is no. A whale is a mammal, it gives live birth, it has warm blood. A uh, loggerhead sea turtle is a reptile, it has scales, it lays eggs, it has cold blood. But how does a whale swim? With flippers, yeah, fins. How does a sea turtle swim? Same way. Why do they have why does a whale and a sea turtle both have flippers, even though they're not closely related to each other? No. Isabella? They both live in the ocean. So Lucas um, initially said, sorry to put you on the spot, Lucas, but he said they have a common ancestor. That's not why they had both have flippers. Now, I will tell you that they both have the same bones in their flippers, okay? That means common ancestor. But they both have flippers because they both live in the ocean. And so they both have to be able to swim about the same way. A shark, which is a fish, a whale, which is a mammal, uh, a sea turtle, which is a reptile, they all have flippers because they all have to swim. That's, co that's convergence evolution. They're not related, but they uh, evolved similar traits. Then we have coevolution. Two or more species adapt and evolve with each other. An example that we did in class was the ant and the fungus. For about 64 million years, an ant and a uh, species of fungus, a carpenter ant and a fungus have been working together to have a symbiotic relationship, but the fungus and the ant's evolution has been guided by each other. The fungi are 100% dependent on the ants now, and the ants depend on the fungus for food, and the fungus depend on the ants for food. So those two evolved together. And that's what co means. All right, adaptive radiation is to spread out. That's what radiation means and evolve into various uh, species. Gradualism is slow, progressive changes. And punctuated equilibrium is long periods of no change with sudden periods of rapid change. So gradualism is change, a little bit more, a little bit more change, always evolving, little by little, little by little, over long periods of time. Punctuated is going to be, and I know I spelled punctuated wrong, I knew it looked wrong to me. There we go. Uh, punctuated equilibrium is gonna be no change, no change, no change, no change, change! No change, no change, no change, no change, no change, change! A lot of change in a very short amount of time. All right, the Miller-Urey experiments. This experiment proved that inorganic molecules in early Earth's atmosphere can serve as the reactants, whoops, make sure I just lost my screen there, okay. Um, can serve for the reactants for forming amino acids. Now here's what I did in class. These are, what gas was absent from early Earth's atmosphere, do you recall? No oxygen, there was no O2 yet. There was no photosynthesis. So here's the gases, H2, CO2, CO, SO2, NO2, CH4. What gases, or excuse me, what elements are found in proteins? Carbon, keep it coming, We're running low on time, come on. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, okay? 
Uh, and amino acids are the building blocks for what macromolecule? Proteins. Well, check this out, guys. Carbon. Carbon. This is exactly what I did in class. Um, hydrogen. Oxygen. Nitrogen. And sulfur. The toxic gases in Earth's early atmosphere could led to amino acids. And that led to protein. Now to continue on this, so first we have protein. Actually, first we had amino acids. And then that led to protein or peptides, same thing. And then that led to RNA. This is the RNA world hypothesis that the first nucleic acid on Earth was RNA, not DNA. And then RNA continued to evolve and that formed DNA. But RNA was is considered to be the first nucleic acid on Earth. This is the RNA world hypothesis. RNA led to DNA, not the other way around. Eventually, we all know that DNA transcribes into RNA. That was on yesterday's lesson. But as far as the beginning of everything, this is what a lot of scientists um, believe actually occurred. OK, and then finally, for this long list of stuff, Endosymbiosis is smaller prokaryotes. Here's a very important word, phagocytize. This means consume. Um, actually, our smaller prokaryotes phagocytized, let's improvise there, phagocytized by larger prokaryotes. And what type of cells did these lead to? Well, those are organelles, Rachel, you're right. Those led to the formation of the mitochondria first and later the chloroplast. But what types of cells did this lead to? This resulted in the first complex cells, resulted in eukaryotes. That's correct. Okay, that's my long laundry list. Now, let's, let me take a look at some of my handwritten notes here. Um, let's try to get as much done as we can, guys. We have about seven minutes left. Um, factors that drive natural selection. Uh, we have competition. Remember, that was the biggest one I told you about. Competition for what? Well, we got space, food. And what's the third one? Mates. That's right. Uh, disease. Surviving disasters. Uh, predator prey relationships. Um, let's see if there's any others I'm leaving out. I think that's enough. So if you have what it takes to survive all that or be an expert at all that, you can really compete for food, space, and mates. You can fight disease. You don't die in a disaster. You're not going to be a victim, and you're going to be. If you are a predator, you are always going to find food. Then you're going to be able. To, you're considered to be biologically fit. Here's another term: biological fitness. See if you guys can finish my sentence. It's reaching reproductive age and doing what? And reproducing. Reaching reproductive age and reproducing. Producing fertile offspring. Okay, when it comes to biological fitness, um, some phenotypes are advantageous and others, other phenotypes are deleterious. That means not so good. If you're short and can't jump, you're not going to make a great uh, basketball player. So some phenotypes are great for a certain lifestyle. Other phenotypes are not so good for that same lifestyle. Um, all right, we did that. I'm just looking at my long list here, and I have a lot. So I want to make sure I get everything. Ooh, uh, phylogeny. Oh, boy, I can't believe I almost forgot this one. 
We have five minutes. Phylogeny. Take a look at this phylogenetic tree. How many common ancestors are there in this phylogenetic tree? One, two, three, four is correct. Very good. A uh, common ancestor is wherever the tree breaks. Which species are would be would you consider to be the most closely related? A and B would be the most closely related because they had the most recent common ancestor on this entire chart. What does this point right here um, indicate? This this section of the tree. That's the common ancestor of everything. Good, 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 good. I'm really trying to hustle here. Take a look at this cladogram. Um, which species are most closely related on this cladogram? B and C would be the most closely related. What makes you say that, Isabella? Okay, let me phrase this a different way. Same answer. Which species would you expect have the fewest differences in their genetics? That's right. The fewer differences you have, the more close related you are. What would you call A? What is this called on a cladogram? It's called an outgroup. Very good. It's the first one that breaks off on its own lineage. And then what would this area in purple be? That's the common ancestor of everything. Good job, guys. We have three minutes. Let's just keep going. I'm looking over everything. Uh, let's talk about extinctions. How many extinctions have there been? Not counting the one we're in. Five mass extinctions. Which one was the worst? One, two, three, four, five. Number three was the worst. That was the great dying. That was the one that allowed the dinosaurs to exist. When an extinction happens, many species are wiped out. But how can extinction be a good thing? This opens niches. It's like a company just fired 50% of their staff. They, they sucked. They were horrible at their job. And they're gone. Guess what? There's a bunch of job openings. So this will allow new occupants to um, for those niches. So when the dinosaurs were around, they were really, really big. They were wiped out. What types of animals filled those niches the dinosaurs left behind? Think of the movie Ice Age. Yeah, the, the smaller animals, and then what did they evolve into? The big guys, yeah. Were there really big mammals during the dinosaur age? No, because they were eaten. But once the dinosaurs were gone, the small mammals could fill the niches the dinosaurs left behind, and they got really, really big. Okay. Um, last one I'm going to have time for. Populations that are more diverse. are healthier and able to withstand um, threats to the gene pool. So if you, have, this is the last thing, the bell just rang, so I really have to wrap it up now. Um, if there's a population that is very, very, very diverse, that's good. That means that there's disease or disaster or something that could threaten the, the existence of, those, of that population. It's going to be more likely to survive. Where if you had a population that was very, very, um, let's just say, monotone, you know, all the same, they're going to be very vulnerable to, to threats. All right. That is it.